The Night Beat starts right now. Heavy rain on the way, as you can see behind me here. Lots of activity tonight. Our meteorologist Adam Kasky has your forecast. Yeah, and looking at the radar out there right now, we've got the main cluster of storms off to the west at the moment, moving through Concan, moving into Bandera as well, and Medina Lake area starting to see some of those showers and thunderstorms develop. The main action and some of the heaviest action is down near Crystal City at the moment. That's where we have the severe thunderstorm near Crystal City and points south and west of San Antonio. But locally, there's a little bit of development here and there. We can zoom in on some of this development. Mia, if you don't mind zooming in on some of this development right here in northwestern Bear County. So developing out ahead of the cluster of thunderstorms, we're seeing a little bit of development there. But that's not the main batch that we have. The main batch is off to the west. It's not severe currently in the hill country. It is severe farther southwest of town. Obviously, a lot of lightning with this. The primary threat and risk will be for some straight line winds up to 60 miles per hour and also the off chance of some hail one inch diameter or more. There's the chance for that as well, but we do think the primary risk here is for the straight line winds potentially up to 60 miles per hour. The arrival of this most likely between 11 p.m. and midnight for San Antonio. We're going to have a closer look at this activity and also time it out with our future cast because there's more rain in the forecast throughout the weekend. Now, emerg emergency officials asking people who live in flood prone areas to prepare by moving important items to higher ground. The night team's Patty Santos returns to a northwest neighborhood that recently flooded to see how homeowners are now preparing. As you see, uh, my, my house here, the water ca damage came about to this high. But if you look at that house here, that high to that house is about this high. The flood water marks are still evident on Daryl Hicks' home. I mean, like, at one second the floor was dry, the next thing you know we were standing there with our boots and stuff on. That's his house, surrounded by flood water in July 2021. It's a neighborhood near Grissom and Heath Lane. He tells us he lost furniture, a car, and electronics. I had a swim pool back there I had to get rid of. The San Antonio River Authority floodplain map shows Hicks and his neighbors are inside a flood zone. So every time it rains, he worries. Yeah, Some of his neighbors sold their homes after the 2021 flood. Hicks says he's warned those who've moved in. Just to get, make sure you have the flood insurance and make sure your car is insured because we didn't get reversed for none of the stuff that we had and like we lost a lot. Now there's been recent changes to the flood map. So if you want to see if your neighborhood is in the flood zone, we have a link to this map on our website, ksat.com. Stephania. Patty, thank you. So as we prepare tonight, we have to think about those who don't have shelter, and that's what the outreach team at Haven for Hope is doing. Pete Barrera with the nonprofit says that he specifically goes to local storm drains to look for people who need shelter because those places can get very dangerous during severe weather. Came in through, they're in a circular type tunnel that comes into a real narrow ravine like this, but it's really narrow. And they were sleeping there or under influence, one of the two, and got caught and snuck up on them. Yeah, tonight, Haven for Hope accepted more people than it usually does. At least 1,500 people are staying on its campus, but the group says that it has room for 100 more people. Bear County and the city of San Antonio not taking any chances with the expected rain. County parks are going to be closed tomorrow and Sunday. Also, the city is postponing the opening of its pools until next weekend. If you do need to get out this weekend, watch out for road closures. We want to let you know that both Bear County and the city of San Antonio post their emergency closures online. We have links to both of those websites right now at ksat.com. Also, now is an awesome, awesome, awesome time to download the KSAT Weather Authority app. It's free. You can use it to check live radar. Also, watch live updates from our team of meteorologists right there on your phone. The KSAT Weather Authority app is available right now in your app store, and you can also do that. Just scan the QR link that you see on your screen and download it from there. Now switching gears, firefighters pulled a man and a dog out of their home while it was on fire. That was around 530 today on Braze Point Drive on the northwest side. That fire ravaged the home's kitchen. Firefighters say the damages are around $20,000.
A former Bear County jailer was sentenced to five years probation for assaulting an inmate. Eduardo Sanchez was charged with aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury in May of 2020. Today, he was sentenced at the, as the Bear County District Attorney's Office says, quote, for intentionally, knowingly, and recklessly causing harm to an inmate while on duty. Sheriff Javier Salazar says that deputies were called to get the inmate under control while he was causing a disturbance. One of those deputies involved was Sanchez, and during the struggle, Sanchez punched the inmate with a pair of handcuffs, injuring his eyes. Sanchez was fired by the sheriff's office after he was indicted by a grand jury. Now we're learning more about the Warren High School teacher who allegedly had an improper relationship with a student. She's 28-year-old Stephanie Woods. She was a biology teacher and also a coach. Police arrested her for allegedly having an inappropriate relationship with a 17-year-old female student. According to the arrest affidavit, the student's friend told their therapist about their relationship, who then reported it to police. And while police spoke with the alleged victim, they say they found evidence of Woods visiting her home. Now Woods' bond is set at $50,000. We also know more tonight about the man that police arrested after a standoff yesterday. He's also accused of shooting and killing a teen boy near Harlandale High School back in 2020. So the victim was 14-year-old Angel Jerry Yanis. Investigators say that Elijah Ramos killed him on December 6th of 2020. And according to the affidavit, a witness arranged a meeting between the boy and Ramos for a drug deal. It also goes on to say that when Yanis approached Ramos's car, the two spoke and then Ramos shot Yanis with his gun. The victim's mother found him in the street, took him to the hospital. That's where he later died. Police didn't arrest Ramos until yesterday. He was inside of an apartment on the northeast side and there was a standoff. And then police also arrested Ramos and three other people. So it's not what they thought. Title 42 no longer in effect in the U.S. And some border cities aren't seeing as many people trying to come into the U.S. as they normally expect. So here's a look inside a 24-hour facility. It's an Eagle Pass. Mission Border Hope is where some migrants go after they're processed. The nonprofit lets them shower, have warm meals in its facility so that then they can travel safely to their destinations. Its executive director expected to be busy after last night, but... That didn't happen. We're very, very busy in 2023, but in comparison of 2022, it's not busy at all. At the end of 2022, we were receiving up to 1,200 people a day. Today, we received a little bit more than 600. It's been like that across Eagle Pass today, but organizations that help migrants say that that can change, so they're still prepared to help more people. However, that is not the case in San Antonio, where city leaders aren't making plans for a mass shelter because they say San Antonio doesn't have the space to serve more migrants. San Antonio, as many of you know, is where a lot of migrants have stopped to get rest before moving on to their next destination. There's the Migrant Resource Center on San Pedro Avenue. It helps thousands of migrants every month. Today, we saw people sitting in a line outside of the building. Catholic Charities runs it, but it wouldn't speak to us or give us any information as to what it's doing. Tomorrow is the country's 31st anniversary of this stamp out food drive. Mail carriers around the nation want you to donate to fight food insecurity. So the United States Postal Service is going to accept food donations that it will then give to local pantries. So when you see your mailman or mail person, you can hand them cans and other non-perishable food tomorrow when you see them. By the way, the food drive has been going on for more than 30 years, and the U.S. Postal Service says it's collected more than 1.82 billion pounds of food during that time. You know what else is this weekend? Yes, the XFL Championship and VIA can get you to and from the game. It's offering trips to the Alamo Dome from the Park and Ride for $1.30 each way. And the Park and Ride is at 151 Crossroads Boulevard. The address is on your screen. VIA is going to start moving people two hours before the game and also one hour after it ends. You don't think about something like this happening to you. Um, I've never, I, you know, you, you hear about it, but uh, until it comes to you, it's, uh, it, it really changes your perspective on things. So that's a U.S. service member who stopped in San Antonio on his way to Nevada. And when he woke up, someone had stolen all of his belongings. It was caught on camera. And now he has a message to the person who took his U-Haul.
Does anybody know anything about this? Yeah, that's a senior airman in the U.S. Air Force. He made a quick stop here in the Alamo City only to have all of his belongings sto stolen from him. But here's the good part. It was caught on camera. Jerome Taborn is relocating from Louisiana to Nevada, and during the move, he decided to stay for a night at his parents' house because they live in northwest San Antonio. Now, what you're looking at right there, that's ring doorbell video. You can see the moment that someone tries tampering with the lock on a U-Haul before getting inside, driving away. Taborn says that his whole life was in that truck. Pretty painful because um, it's, just, it's just confirming that the fact that it wasn't an accident, like somebody was out there and they were they were going through my stuff and they were working hard to get what I like what I had and what I earned and that pretty much everything that I have it really hurts people when you, you you take their things and you steal from them yeah don't take people's stuff Taborn says that he hopes the person who stole his U-Haul is going to bring back his belongings if you know anything that happened there if you can help police find the person who did that who took stuff from Jerome Taborn call SAPD the number is 210-207-7273. You know, as we get ready for heavy rain this weekend, let's hope that we don't see anything like our neighbors just north of us. Dr. Daphne Ledoux was rolling when she saw that funnel cloud forming yesterday in Cole, Oklahoma. That's about 30 minutes south of Oklahoma City. Now, luckily for those people there, they didn't get damaged. But that, what you're looking at there, is a totally different story in Weskin, Kansas. It's right near the Colorado border. That's a school building. Right there, it's heavily damaged. The storm tore the roof, damaged the bleachers at the football field. But luckily, nobody was hurt. And we could have a few wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour as these storms approach. That, I think, would be the exception opposed to the norm, but that threat does exist. Now, what you see here at near Shirts, New Braunfels, those are the Bracken bats leaving, so that's not storm activity. We are seeing some development here. Northwestern Bear County, just outside of Gray Forest and now around Pipe Creek. These are little lone thunderstorms that have developed out ahead of the main cluster. You see the main cluster moving through the hill country, moving into Kerrville or moving through Kerrville right now into Bandera as well. I'm going to stop it just so you can see where it's currently raining. A lot of lightning and thunder with this, but nothing severe in those locations. The severe part of this line is farther to the south, and this is a new severe thunderstorm warning we have until 11:15 p.m. And this is for southeastern Uvalde, a good portion of Zavala County, and even Frio County. This part of the storm here. This is stronger that could more likely have 60 mile per hour wind gusts and even the potential for hail one to one and a quarter inches in diameter. As for timing that out, this part hasn't been moving quite as fast as the rest of it uh, so far today, but to give you an idea of when it would arrive, Batesville 1025, Sabinal 1102, Frio Town at 1106. And let's just say that this severe portion right down there just around Crystal City and north of Crystal City. Let's say it just stays on that track and continues its way towards San Antonio. Then that section would be on the west side of 1604 by 1205 a.m. So that's what we have right now. Not a lot around the Alamo City, but as we were talking about earlier, the arrival between about 11 p.m. and midnight. Purple indicates some areas of hail potentially within there again, maybe up to an inch in diameter and some wind gusts. At times, if this bows out 60 to 70 miles per hour possible within this uh, really quickly, I want to switch over to some of the rainfall totals already with this initial initial batch of rain. We've seen totals on the order of two plus inches. I mean, look at this red area just west of Carrizo Springs. Look at that 6.1 inches. West of Crystal City, west of La Prior, 2.7 inches. And this is just the initial push. We're going to have more rain as we get into the weekend. Here's a quick look at the future cast. I think this one has a better handle than it has for quite some time. 11 p.m. to midnight moving through town. The highest winds should be on the leading edge of the main cluster of thunderstorms. And then coming through, moving through east of town by 3 a.m., maybe a little bit of a break right before sunrise, but then redevelopment into Saturday morning and then get ready for more rain 
into the weekend. And for that, let's go over to Mia. Mia, we're talking about, you know, the rain tonight, but this is just kind of the beginning of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the biggest thing to know, because there's a lot going on this weekend, right? We've got Mother's Day, people trying to get out and about for weekend plans, especially by tomorrow afternoon here in San Antonio and then into Mother's Day itself on Sunday. It's not going to be raining constantly every second of the day, but still intermittent rain. Some passing showers and thunderstorms are still in the forecast. So here's a day part look here at your Saturday. Again, more widespread coverage is expected. Some additional rain and thunderstorms with that development that Adam was just showing you through at least lunchtime. Temperatures starting off in the 60s and then as we head into the afternoon, that's more on a scattered basis. Temperatures could climb though into the mid to upper 70s here in San Antonio. As we take a look at your Sunday, you can see temperatures are pretty similar there as well. And yes, some periods of rain, intermittent passing showers and storms will still be a possibility. We were already looking at some of those rainfall totals for folks that were able to pick up on some of those stronger storms and heavier downpours. The general widespread theme through Sunday night, generally to the tune of about three to five inches possible in area rain gauges, but localized higher totals certainly expected in spots there as well. So a lot to monitor here as we head into the upcoming weekend. Yes, those intermittent rain chances continue, so you will want to keep the rain gear handy and also just keep eyes on the roadways because some flash flooding instances will be possible there as well, mainly needing to monitor common trouble spots there first through Monday because you can see here on your seven day forecast. Yes, still have a 70% potential for some additional rounds of rain there. And then as we head into the middle to later portions of next week, the general trend being a little bit drier with temperatures climbing back into the 80s. So we'll keep eyes on all of that. Let's go outside to live cam because I bet right now we can find maybe some flashes of lightning out there. If we don't see any, we will probably very shortly. And of course, we will keep eyes on all of this, your KSAT Weather Authority app throughout the remainder of the night and into this weekend as well. All right, Mia, thank you. So, okay, NFL training camp, we all know that's in July, right? right. But then you have the rookie mini camp for the rookies, and that's happening next week. Uh, it's happening right now, actually. They started on the field today. It's about oh, happens over the weekend. It feels like we just figured out who's on the team. Guess what? Now they're already being thrown out onto the field. When we come back, we'll hear from the Texans on seeing their top two draft picks out on the field for the first time, plus state champs at track and field. We got a great performance from Birdie Champion next. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. With their schedule now set, the Dallas Cowboys got all of their rookies signed and are ready to start the mini camp. For rookies, camp will continue through the 15th at the Star in Frisco. Mozzie Smith might be the headliner as a first round pick, but everyone is pulling for running back Deuce Vaughn. You may remember he's the son of a Cowboys scout and had an emotional phone call with his dad on the third day of the NFL draft. It was a special moment, but he knows it won't help him make the roster ready to move on to the next step. Uh, so try to clear out of my head as fast as possible and just get ready to work. Uh, get here and, and, and gain the respect of everybody inside this building, the coaches, uh, not only my rookie class, but the, the upperclassmen whenever uh, they come back and say we get with them. Uh, but just letting it, letting it be known it's just not a good story. During minicamp, there are no padded practices. Organized team activities, though, begin on May 22nd. The Houston Texans had their first chance to see their second and third overall draft picks in action this afternoon. That, of course, being quarterback C.J. Stroud and pass rusher Will Anderson Jr. What did head coach D'Amico Ryans want to see from them on day one? Simple things for these guys, just getting in the huddle saying a play call, coming out of the hole. It's the simple things that those guys have to get used to that's different from the college game where a lot of things are coming from the sideline, a lot of pictures, a lot of signal-based things, and they, they're not used to verbalizing and communicating a lot. So for us, it's like we're taking them back a couple steps to huddling, making sure they're, they're – uh, <laughs> speaking loudly when they're in the huddle offensively and defensively and making sure as a quarterback and as linebackers making sure that they are commanding those huddles 
Texans rookie minicamp continues through the 14th. San Antonio will play host to the XFL championship this weekend in the Alamo Dome. Unfortunately, the Brahmas won't be there. Instead, the North Division champion DC Defenders will take on the South Division champion Arlington Renegades for the inaugural XFL title. The Renegades are led by head coach Bob Stutes, who mainly has experience from college ball at Oklahoma, where there's nearly a month between the end of their regular season and bowl games. At media availability this afternoon, Stoops was asked to compare this year's two-week prep with what he's used to. Bowl prep used to be like spring ball where we took the seniors out and just used the young guys. Well, we're not, a, you know, you can't do that here. So anyhow, uh, it's, 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 there's not a lot to compare really, but uh, we've had plenty of time to get prepared and ready. And that part of it, you know, is seems natural. Here is a look at the championship trophy. Kickoff in the Dome is set for 7 p.m. tomorrow night. BYL State Track and Field Championships continue this afternoon with Class 5A action, and due to inclement weather, events were started on a rolling basis. We start our coverage with the girls' 200-meter dash. How about sophomore Alyssa Jones out of Smithson Valley, hanging with the leaders at the turn, and then she turns on the afterburners down the stretch, coming home to win it in 23.59 seconds. Jones also took silver in the long jump. Meanwhile, Seguin's senior Christian Ramirez dominated the 400-meter wheelchair division, crossing the line first in one minute, 4.26 seconds, one of two medals he won on the day. And last but certainly not least, Bernie champion freshman Elizabeth Leachman absolutely crushed the field in the girls' 1,600-meter run. She wins it in four minutes, 47.28 seconds, a victory by nine full seconds. Here's a look at some more podium finishes from our area. The Smithson Valley girls won the 4x200 and 4x400 meter relays en route to claiming the overall team title with 62 total points. Meanwhile, Smithson Valley junior Freddie DuBose finished third overall in the boys 400 meter run with a time of 48.68 seconds. Alamo Heights senior Leo Bowen is bringing home silver in the pole vault. Seguin's Daisha Schuler took second in the 100 meter dash and in the wheelchair division, Stevens senior Alicia Mears took second in the shot put. We have links to full results right now on the BGC page at KSAT.com. After last night's 2-0 victory, the Johnson baseball team is a win away from advancing to the third round of the playoffs. Tonight is game two of their series against Austin Bowie at the Burger Center. Pick this one up in the top of the third. Game tied at one. Base is loaded. Casey Cunningham knocks a base hit into right. Two runs come in to score, and the Jags go up 3-1. The inning still continues. Nobody out. Mason Cron drives one into left. That'll play to another pair, capping a seven-run inning. Ty Hawkins goes four for four at the plate tonight. Johnson cruises to a big win, 12 to three. They advance to face either San Marcos or Lake Travis in the third round. UTSA baseball plays their biggest series of the season. Next. Due to inclement weather, UTSA baseball rearranged their series against Dallas Baptist and scheduled a doubleheader this afternoon. The Roadrunners started strong in game one. Bottom two, one on. Leighton Barry sends a seeing eye single right up the middle. Dalton Porter will round third and score for an early 2 0 Roadrunners lead, but UTSA drops game one 11 7. They currently trail 11 9 in the bottom of the ninth in game two. They'll wrap up the series tomorrow afternoon, hoping for some better luck in this inning and obviously tomorrow. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. All right, main cluster of storms still off to the west uh, in the hill country. We got some heavy rain around Kerrville. Could be a little bit of small hail embedded within that, but nothing severe or damaging and nothing severe throughout Bandera County. You get to the heavier action. I'm going to switch radars, get a better idea of this. And this is from Uvalde all the way down toward Batesville right now. And this is the severe thunderstorm, which is headed to the northeast. So Pearsall, uh, even Sabinal and locations in between up toward Moore and Batesville. That's where we have the threat for the straight line winds of up to 60 miles per hour and even the potential for some one inch diameter hail. I'm going to put a quick track on this and there you go. Uh, Frio Town 1112, Yancey at 1130 and Mellon at 1138. So we're tracking all this activity and keep in mind on the back side of it, there's more. We're seeing more development and we're expecting that trend once this makes it here between 11 p.m. and midnight around San Antonio. That's when it should start. We'll see the activity persist into the night and have more showers and storms into your Saturday and even Sunday as well. Flash flooding, a big possibility, and even some severe storms possible through 2 a.m.